If you will, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, as we continue in our series of studies, the overall theme or topic being, Is It Lawful? In Luke chapter 14, we read about a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. It says, beginning there in verse 1, Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent, and he took and healed him, and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So Jesus confronts them about this idea of something being lawful or not, of whether or not really there is authority for a particular action. And this is the idea, and our studies are based on, A question of authority. Is it allowed or is it not allowed? Is it authorized by God's word? Is it according to God's will? Will it please him or will it displease him? In Luke 14, the Pharisees and the lawyers had a different view about healing on the Sabbath than Jesus. Now we see by Jesus' actions that it was lawful, it was authorized. And in his argumentation, he proved to them that it was that way because he even put it on them, well, which of you, having a sheep, a donkey, you have an animal that's stuck on the Sabbath, you're going to get it out. So if you can do that, then I can heal on the Sabbath. And they understood that, but they didn't want to admit it because they wanted to condemn him. They wanted to try to frame it before the people that what Jesus did was unlawful, it was unauthorized, it was displeasing, and therefore he had to be rejected as a man of God and as, of course, ultimately the, the Savior, the Messiah. Now, the question of whether it is lawful or not, at the very root of it, if you will, determines our fellowship with God. Because if it's lawful, it is righteous, and we are therefore in fellowship with God, If it is unlawful, that means it is sinful, and we are not in fellowship with God. We live in a time where that which determines a thing being lawful or not is determined by the authority of Christ because we live under the authority of Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, 18, you remember, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, it says that Christ is the head of man. In Colossians 1.18, it says he's the head of the church. And in 1 Timothy 6.15, it says that he is king of kings and lord of lords. He has all authority. He has authority over us individually. He has authority over the church universal. He has authority over the church locally. Jesus has all authority and we are either going to respect that authority or we will not respect his authority. And let's understand this. His authority is not some ambiguous idea. It is not some nebulous feeling, but it's concrete and plainly revealed in the word of God. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 verse 40, remember he said this. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So really what he's talking about there is a chain of authority. From the Father to the Son to the apostles, his ambassadors and representatives on this earth. And he says, whoever receives you, his ambassadors, Peter, James, John, others who are inspired to teach his will, he who receives you receives me. And the idea is that we listen to them, we're listening to the Lord because he sent them out with a message. He sent them out to reveal his will to mankind. And so his authority is expressed in the New Testament. And there are proper ways of establishing authority. And these proper ways are illustrated throughout the Bible. In 
many different lessons that we can learn from it. The Bible does not mean whatever we want it to mean. We can't go to a passage and find five different legitimate meanings to a passage. Now we may find application that applies in different ways, different areas, at different times. But on any single point of truth, there are not five legitimate different understandings of that truth. It cannot be. For instance, we cannot simultaneously say Jesus is the divine Son of God and Jesus never came in the flesh. We can't say that. We can't say that He was a created being and at the same time say He is an eternal being. One or the other is true. And we are not to have this conception that both are legitimately believed by different people because they are contradictory to one another. So the Bible cannot mean whatever we want it to mean. There are rules governing interpretation and understanding the Word of God. There are rules that determine how we understand what we must do what we may do, and what we must not do. In this lesson, we're going to look at generic and specific authority. We're going to look at very basic fundamental understanding. What is generic authority? What is specific authority? And we're going to begin by illustrating it and going through the account of the Old Testament about the Passover. So if you'll turn back to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, and just recall, of course, that the children of Israel were slaves down in Egypt. They cried out to God in their suffering. Moses was sent in Exodus chapter 3, called to be their deliverer. Go down to Egypt, lead my people out of Egypt. And then in Exodus 7 through 10, you have the unfolding of the plagues that God brought against the Egyptians to try to break their will so that they would let the children of Israel go. So you have the plague of the water to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, diseased livestock, the boils, the hell, the locusts, the darkness. All those things that came against them, but yet they were stubborn and resistant. So God said there's going to be one more plague and it is going to break them, and then you will be set free. And let's read that in Exodus chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Exodus 11, 1 through 6. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall it be like it again. So that revealing of that tenth plague and the death of the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt. And in order to prepare for this so that the children of Israel did not suffer under this last plague, the Lord gives them the Passover and He gives very specific things in this Passover. Here's what you are to do so that you do not experience this death in your household. So in Exodus chapter 12, let's read verses 1 down through 14. We'll just grab the whole reading here. Exodus 12, 1 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. 
And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall, not let, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So we see the authority of the Lord, both generic and specific, in the Passover. He says that they are to take this lamb on the tenth day of the month. That this lamb is to be without blemish. That is to be a male of the first year of the sheep or of the goats. They're to keep it till the 14th day of the month. The blood is to be put on the posts and on the lentils. And they are to eat the flesh roasted, not boiled and not raw. They're to eat it with bitter herbs, the head, the legs, the entrails. They're to burn the leftovers the next day. He even tells them how it is that they are to be dressed with a belt on their waist, sandals on their feet, a staff in their hand. Now when you fast forward a year from there, and you get to Numbers chapter 9, Numbers chapter 9, and I know in reading this we may think, wait, that's only a year? Yes, it is only a year, essentially between really Exodus chapter 14 and Numbers chapter 9, as we will notice here. But the Lord reminds them they are to keep this Passover and then they have to deal with the situation that comes up. In Exodus, or rather Numbers chapter 9, in verses 1 through 5 is where He reminds them. We want to pick up in verse 6. It says, Now there was a certain men who were defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day, and those men said to him, We became defiled by a human corpse. Why are we kept from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moses said to him, Stand still, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse, or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the fourteenth day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it, that they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And so he gives them an exception to that Passover. And he goes on to tell them, everything else is the same. Don't alter it. Don't, don't change it in any other way. So, let's think for just a moment before we get further down into specifics on this, that authority is either generic or it is specific. Generic includes everything in a class of things. So, for instance, if I were to say to you, bring me an animal. Well, that includes all animals. You can bring me a dog a cat, a horse, if I say bring me an animal. Because saying animal includes everything that would describe or fit within that realm of animals. 
If I were to tell you to bring me a sheep, well, it would include all the sheep. Now, white sheep, black sheep, brown sheep, spotted sheep, whatever kind of sheep there are, that would be included. If I were to say, bring me some wood, you could bring me pine or oak. Or I tell you, I'm going to build my house out of wood. Well, I might have pine studs and I might have cedar in the closets. I might have oak as a beam or something like that or paneling in there. But it's wood. So it includes all kinds of wood. Specific authority excludes anything else in a class. So I tell you to bring me a male animal, that means you cannot bring me a female. If I say bring me a sheep for the first year, all other years are excluded, or acacia wood. Well, all the other woods are excluded. And to illustrate this sort of in our day-to-day -day life, and I think everyone could understand this, if you have a recipe and it says to put in that recipe a cup of sugar and you put in a cup of salt, I mean it's white grains, right? We understand that. It says a cup of sugar. Well, you put in a cup of salt, you're going to have something nasty. Not going to be able to eat, it's going to be gross. So we understand how that specific authority works. It excludes other things within that class. So think about this. When Moses told the children of Israel that they were to take and to keep a lamb. Take. That's generic. Right? Could be the father. Could be the son that takes it. Could be the daughter. They're sent out to take the lamb from the flock. Could be a servant. It could be all of them together. Maybe they have a lot of them and they need to get out there and they need to separate and control them while one of them grabs a specific land that they need. What about keeping it? Remember, they're to keep it from the 10th day to the 14th day. So, it says take and keep. It's to be separated out. They could keep it in shelter of some kind where they have a little roof over their head. They may be in a pen where they're enclosed, could be they're attached to a rope so they don't get away. But take and keep. Those are generic. They're to keep it for four days. Maybe they feed it grass, maybe they feed it grain, maybe they feed it both. But those things are generic in nature. You think about the clothing that he mentioned there. It says that they were to have a belt around their waist. Well, does that belt need to be leather? rope? Does it need to be wide or thin? Does it need to be fixed together with a knot or a buckle? See, all of that is generic. It just says put on a belt. Have a belt on your waist. The same thing with the sandals. Leather woven, a staff, three feet, four feet, six feet long. What kind of wood is it made out of? Is it made out of acacia wood? Is it made out of some other kind of wood? That's not germane to them having a staff. They would have a staff. But then, you think about the lamb. Specific authority. They were to take that lamb without blemish, a male of the first year, it said from the sheep or the goats. So when it says a lamb from the sheep or the goats, that means they could not take a donkey or an oxen or a camel. Because it's very specific about the animal. A lamb. A male of the first year, not a female of the second year. Not a male of the second year. But a male of the first year. See how that's specific and it excludes all others? He says you take it in this beginning of months that he assigns to this month in which the Passover was instituted. You take it on the 10th of the month. And you keep it until the 14th and you kill it then at twilight. So they could not keep it till the 15th. They were not to kill it on the 13th. But to take it on the 10th and keep it till the 14th at twilight when it was to be slaughtered, when it was to be killed. They could not do it in the 4th month or the 8th month. It was unauthorized. When he said the 10th day of the 1st month, take it the 14th, you slaughter it, you observe the Passover, that nails it down. 
Those other things are excluded except where we read in Numbers chapter 9 where the Lord had to be asked very specifically, is there an exception here? And he said there's an exception if they've been defiled by a corpse or on a faraway journey. Second month, tenth day, same way as before, all the other things apply. That's the only exception there was. And so there's generic authority, there is specific authority. Now let's go to the Lord's Supper to illustrate this in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26, remember, it is that Feast of Unleavened Bread, Matthew 26, verse 17, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> so they're there, they're observing that, Jesus and His disciples. And as we had read previously around the table in Matthew 26, verse 26, it says this, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here he institutes the Lord's Supper during that observance of the Passover which required them to have the unleavened bread and then they had the fruit of the vine at the table. If you fast forward in the New Testament to Acts chapter 20, Acts 20, you see where the disciples practiced this breaking of bread, observing the Lord's Supper in Matthew, or rather Acts 20 verse 7, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So, let's break this down a little bit. When you think about general authority, observing the Lord's Supper, containers. How, how do we distribute that unleavened bread and that fruit of the vine? You know, there's some brethren that thinks there's three elements in the Lord's Supper. There's some brethren who think there's the unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, and a physical cup. But that's not what we read here. Unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. When Jesus refers to the cup, He's referring really to what is in the cup. But how do we distribute that? How do we get that to everyone? Well, the containers could be glass or plastic cups like we generally see among brethren. There's a plastic cup sometime. And when I was very young, it was generally glass. And then they have to take them and clean them and all those things. But that was perfectly legitimate. It could be many cups. It could be one cup. That would not violate having fruit of the vine. The size of the cups or the pieces of bread you know, various places they have different sizes. We have these little square pieces here. There are some, you know, they have the big cracker, if you will. And people, when they observe it, they break off different pieces. I've seen people just barely get a little bitty pinch of it. I've seen people get a pretty good chunk off of that main cracker. But it doesn't change it. They're still eating unleavened bread. The trays that we have or things like that could be metal, could be a woven basket. In the Philippines, I've seen them use just a flat piece of wood, almost like a piece of paneling, and the holes are drilled in it, and that's where they put the cups. You could have a napkin that covers it or a napkin that sits under the bread. It doesn't matter because it's still unleavened bread. It is still fruit of the vine. Now, when do you do it in worship? You know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, Acts 2, verse 42, it says, And he continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. It just gives us there, here's what they're doing in worshiping. It's not giving a specific order in which things are done. Later it says that Paul was there with them. They broke bread and then he spoke his message. So, 
there's no specific order given to us, and so that's generic in authority. It could be first. I've, I've known of congregations, in fact, where we were in Kentucky, the very first thing done is observing the Lord's Supper. You have a song, and then you observe the Lord's Supper, but you wouldn't even technically need to have a song. Men could just get up, and they could begin to talk about the Lord's Supper. We could serve the Lord's Supper, do the giving, all of that. First, second, third, fourth, last in services. How it is served, one, two, four dozen men. It's generic. I worshipped, Hannah with me, worshipped at a place in Australia where they walked up front. It's a smaller congregation. They just all walked up front and they observed it. And they all went back to their seats. It made me feel uneasy. But they did it. Like, okay. Yeah. That, that's the way they did it. It was not disorderly. I could see it becoming disorderly, but that was not disorderly. So there are various ways to distribute those elements. How it is served among the brethren. The time that we do it is at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 a.m., 9 p.m. All that falls under that generic authority because we're still observing the Lord's Supper, we're partaking the unleavened bread, we're partaking of the fruit of the vine. It does not change the command that is given. But then there's some specific authority as well. We talked about the unleavened bread. It's not loaf bread or donuts or biscuits or things like that. The Mormon church uses loaf bread. They use regular sandwich type bread. We are to partake of the fruit of the vine. That's specific. And understanding that it was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we know that it was not intoxicating, it was not fermented, because all that yeast had to be out of there. So it is grape juice that we are to partake. It's not water or coffee or tea, but the fruit of the vine. And it says we are to do this, Acts 20 verse 7, upon the first day of the week. We cannot do it on Thursday or Saturday. You know, there's a trend among the denominational world around us that on special occasions they will observe the Lord's Supper. No matter what day that occasion falls on, no matter what setting it may be, and sometimes it's around the holiday, or more and more I've seen people, they do it at a wedding ceremony. That may be a Friday or Saturday they're doing that on. So, people will go outside of what is specifically stated. But again, specific authority excludes. So when it says the first day of the week, that excludes every other day of the week. When it says unleavened bread, when it says fruit of the vine, it excludes all other elements. Those are the things that we are to follow or we will be in violation of the Word of God. If you will, open to number... Is that 505? 505. So again, our actions as well as our beliefs in the name of the Lord must be lawful. We have to submit to His authority. That authority is expressed in His Word. And it has definite meaning to it. We have to make the correct application of it. When we properly discern and apply the truth, we have the confidence in our beliefs and practices and we have the hope of heaven. If we're not properly discerning, we're not properly applying, we do not have the hope of heaven. So a question for you personally, individually. Are you living by the Lord's will? The way you behave day to day, the way you live day to day, is it lawful? 
We didn't talk about things and personal morals and things like that in the lesson, but as you examine your life, do you understand that you are out of harmony with the Lord, that you're doing things that are not lawful, that would be condemned, things that you would be ashamed of if the brethren knew it? If so, then won't you repent of that? Won't you confess it before the Lord and seek His mercy and forgiveness? And if you are not a child of God and you recognize that you need to become one, then won't you come and confess Jesus as the Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized to have your sins washed away, and you can arise and walk in the newness of life. You can enjoy the benefits of the sacrifice of Christ. Until then, though, you don't enjoy those benefits. You don't enjoy the forgiveness. You don't enjoy the hope of everlasting life. But you can have that today. And so if you need to respond, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.